Stuben's dream plan for his estate on these 60 acres. It would include a major house, carriage barns, stables, orchards, things like that. Next, please. A grand estate. Now we have Faroe's map, but are there any other maps out there? Surely Faroe didn't pull this out of his head. Well, on the left you have a 1792 map that was hand-drawn by John Linkling, who was a land agent from Casanova, where I live. And he had personally visited the Baron's estate, and that's what he saw. Now we have the map in the middle, which is unknown. We do, it's not signed, we don't know who did it, and I just found out this morning that it was done in 1792 by Benjamin Wright in the last for one dollar. That was his original design, and then on the right-hand side you have the, the core of the Faro map. Next slide, please. And this is where we start to analyze things, because you've got to make comparisons and contrasts. And you see, when you start doing historic overlays, <coughs> in order to pinpoint where the Baron's house was and where his orchards and whatnot were on the modern map to make sure that we are protecting the right area of land. You start to notice that there's some differences. Next slide, please. You see on the Benjamin Wright map, on the upper left-hand corner, that's the footprint of what the Grand Estate house was supposed to look like. But it changes on the right-hand side when you get to Faro. Now, that could be just a design change. And then underneath on the left-hand side, you can see where the axial delineation of the tree line has changed from straight lines to curvilinear lines, which is understandable because we're moving into the neoclassical period and so we get a lot more roundy kind of things. So I decided one day, and this is where accidents make great discoveries, I decided one day to sit down at the computer and figure out what the sight lines were from where the Baron's house was, because he could look out over five valleys down into the Mohawk River area. Does anybody see something interesting there? Just in the lower quadrant, do you see a circle? and the straight lines. Next slide, please. Do we have Masonic symbols? Is this Stuben's basically his tracing board? Are these symbols that he has moved into his design as an expression of what his personal ideals and values were? You see you have the triangle with the all seeing eye in the center. That was a pond that Steuben hand dug with Faro the summer of 1794. It's in his journal. You see on the right hand side, between Benjamin Wright's map and Faro's map, the entry road has changed from an irregular jig to a square, a right hand square. On the right hand side, upper, you have a 1760 floor plan, the master's plan. You can see the, the um, the document to the side there, it's an exact copy of it. You have the 3-4 three, triangle, 3-4-5 three, triangle. You have a, an image of the apprentice's apron. You have an inverted compass. You know how the masons have the square and the compass? You might expect to see a regular compass, but this is inverted, and that has special significance within the Masonic uh, lodges. And you have the four quarters of the world. Now, the human mind is remarkable in its ability to find symbolism where there is not, to find codes in manuscripts where there are not, to find secret messages to assassinate Chavez's brother by a machine gun, and they're just not there. It's wild imagination, or is it coincidence? So, is this coincidence, or is it an artifact? Is it an artifact of geometry, an accident of using classical dimensions, or are they real symbols? Next slide, please. Okay, we know Washington was a Mason. We know most of the founding fathers were Masons. We know that symbolism was very important in the 18th century. Now we also know that there are all sorts of discussions out on the internet about Masonic symbols, being hidden in the map of Washington, D.C. that was developed by L'Enfant, 
who was also a friend of Stuben and Washington's. But the way I approach this particular question is, given the 60 acres that Stuben had to work with and was mapping out, and the number of symbols that we find, supposed symbols that we find, compared with the number of symbols that people have found in Washington, D.C.'s layout, I think there's a likely chance that the Masonic symbols in Faro's map are real. And the reason I say that is because they are so concentrated in a 60-acre radius, not all across Washington, D.C., which might be an artifact of geometry. So Roger Kennedy and I <clears throat> used to have long conversations about this. He was fascinated by the possibility of it because he identified the Faro map as the first professionally designed landscape for an estate in the United States. And if it had Masonic symbols in it, that's phenomenal. That's just amazing. It's very common in Europe. You find all sorts of Masonic symbols in public parks and private villas and things like that. So if it's present in Europe, why wouldn't Stu Men bring that concept, that expression with him? So I think it's very viable that we have this incredible find. Next slide. The next incredible find is, do you remember the footprint of the map on Benjamin Wright's map? It's a central core with two flankers. Looks very similar to Mount Vernon, okay? Well, one of the things that Steuben was doing down in New York, he engaged an architect by the name of Joseph Newton, and we've only just discovered this within the last two months. This building, this elevation was Steuben's dream house. This was supposed to be his retirement estate. We know that Joseph Newton was teaching architecture between 1785 and 1786. We know that Joseph Newton was a Mason. We know that he crossed paths with the Baron. So to find this, which has been lost since the 1930s, is again another remarkable find that will bring us greater insight about the Baron because not only did he think he could afford something like that, he knew he could afford something like that because he commissioned this elevation and a complete set of plans. This is the only piece that we have found so far. They were originally in an institution in upstate New York. In the 1930s, they appear to have been brought down here for a lecture. Um, and after that, their trail was lost until we found this. Thank God for the internet and Al Gore who invented it. <laughs> it's amazing, just amazing. But the other remarkable thing about this, and again, is this real or are we just reading things into it? Steuben was a tremendous fan of Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great's favorite hideaway place was Saint Souci. Take a look at the architectural elements out of Sans Souci and tell me what you see in Steuben's dream castle. Beginning with the left hand side, you have the colonnaded walkway. You have the central pile with the pediment coming out with four columns. Four columns with ionic capitals. They're not Corinthian, they're not Doric, they're ionic capitals. And then finally, this, this folly that was in the garden at Saint Souci is actually called the Temple of Friendship. And that is a very important piece within the 18th century of the sense of camaraderie. It's a part of the Enlightenment. And here on Steuben's Dream Castle, on either end surrounding his house, are replicas of Frederick the Great's temple. This just gets me so excited. I can't wait. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, I'm going back to the, Na the uh, New York State Historical Society to see if we can find the rest. We didn't find it this morning, so I'm just hoping that we can find the rest of that architectural set tomorrow. So wish me luck. Next. So Steuben stayed very active. He never gave up on his dreams. It isn't that what we're all about. We have our personal freedoms to succeed and we have our dreams and we can achieve them if we wanted to. His last piece of public service was to go out towards Syracuse 
identify a location for a blockhouse in order to guard the western frontier because after the war he was used on military contract by George Washington himself to check the furthest outposts, the ones the British wouldn't give us until 1812. He sent Steuben, his close aide and confidant, to go try and get the British to give them up. And he reviewed the local militiamen, which was probably oh, beyond his experience, but I'm sure he did it with great love and great attention to their efforts. Next. So today, people are taught and they think of the Baron as dying a pauper, alone, unloved, except for Azor. And that's what we carry down generation after generation. And I hope tonight that we've been able to show that that's not necessarily the case. Next slide. He died with one thing in mind, and that's one thing that my parents taught me, and I'm sure a lot of your parents taught you, is that you leave something better off than when you found it, right? And that comes all the way back to the classics again, and Steuben was a devotee of the classics. From the oath of the Athenian city-state, every kid by the time of age 12 had to take this oath or they did not receive their citizenship and the privileges that came with it. And you can see on the right hand side, we will revere and obey the city's laws. We will transmit this city not only less, but greater, better, and more beautiful than it was transmitted to us. And I think that's what the Baron was all about. He did it through his military career. He did it through his retirement years. And to me, next slide please. The Baron answered America's call, answered the call of the Enlightenment because he served us with duty, honor, and he served his country till the very end. Next slide please. And we should always remember that because a grateful nation does remember and as the World War II poster says, they, you, they, we still rely on the image of Valley Forge when we need to inspire ourselves. The Americans will always fight for liberty, and that's what the Baron was fighting for. Next slide. So thank you very much. I appreciate your time and attention and your good humor. So thank you very much, Nancy. Thank you. And with this, Nancy, don't, don't run away. Where are you going? I, I want the You want the chocolate? Pudding there that's on your table waiting for you. Before you enjoy the chocolate pudding, I would like to thank you once again. It's apple strudel, I'm sorry. I just looked like chocolate. It's my fantasy. Chocolate. Um, Nancy, I would like to thank you on behalf of the German American Committee of Greater New York, the Steuben Society, the Steuben Trade Committee, and I would like to uh, give you this uh, Steuben Trade silver coin that is engraved for you that we give to all our friends who we work with in German American Friendship Month. Thank you so, Thank you so much for your, for your wonderful talk that you gave to us and for all the information you shared. A big round of applause for Nancy the Mutineer. Thank you very much. Now enjoy your dessert, have a wonderful evening, have another beer, have another glass of wine, and I hope you all had a wonderful time here at Francis Tavern. Thank you all for coming. Thank you very much.